The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. I am delighted to welcome you to today's webinar on entering Southeast Asian markets. My name is William Barnes Graham, and I am Digital Content Manager at Big Into Export. We are an online community helping small UK businesses get ready to sell overseas through our step-by-step -step articles and guides, regular webinars, Ask the Experts forum, and our Export Action Plan tool. You can find all of these on our website at www.opentexport.com. Open to Export is powered by the Institute of Exports and International Trade, the UK's only professional membership body for international trade, offering a unique range of individual and business membership benefits, education and training catering for beginners through to master's degrees, and an always exciting and prestigious programme of events celebrating UK businesses' exporting achievements. We will be running a live Q&A at the end of the session, and you can ask questions at any point during the webinar using the question box on the control panel to the right-hand side of your screen. We have three wonderful speakers today, bringing a wide range of experiences selling and helping businesses sell into the ASEAN region. Neil Smith from Polyseam will be talking about his experiences exports, exporting into the region, as will Godfrey Sutka from the Institute of Export, who has plenty of experience actually working out in the region. While kicking things off, we have Paul North from the UK ASEAN Business Council to give an overview of some of the opportunities for UK businesses in the region. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, Will, and uh, good afternoon, everybody um, from the UK, and uh, good evening to those who are listening and uh, joining the webinar from uh, from the region in ASEAN. My name's Paul North, as Will said, and I'm a trade advisor with the UK ASEAN Business Council. And I'd like to give you a little bit of information about ASEAN, about the countries, uh, and a little bit about what we do as UK ASEAN Business Council, and how we help companies who have products and services, uh, and how we help them sell them into the ASEAN markets. So what is ASEAN? The Association of Southeast Asian Nations was established in 1967 to accelerate cultural development, economic growth, and social progress throughout the region. It is aimed to promote regional peace and stability, and since 1967, it has grown to include 10 countries. That's Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. All are very diverse, economically, culturally, and politically, from the high-tech sectors of Singapore to the recently opened upmarket of Myanmar. The Asian way, or ideal, was established to build a more stable, peaceful, and prosperous life for everyone. Next slide, please. ASEAN is strategically placed as a geographical hub between China and India, it has a young dynamic consumer market with a population of over 630 million and an average age of just 26. ASEAN is similar in part to other single markets with the slow and steady integration of economies, but with no common currency or free movement of people. Next slide, please. So the ASEAN Economic Community, AEC, this was uh, one of the first milestones of ASEAN to take place by the establishment of the AEC, which is an evolving agreement rather than an end state. The AEC is a powerful declaration of intent and a way of boosting investment and prosperity across the region. This happened in November 2015 and the ASEAN Economic Community Agreement aims to create one of the largest single market economies in the world, a world competitive economic region, regional development, and integration into the global economy. Next slide, please. So ASEAN is the sixth largest economy in the world, home to more people than Europe, and has the world's third largest labor force. Infrastructure requirements in this region means ASEAN needs to spend around 46 billion sterling each year over the next decade. By 2030, the economy is predicted to be the world's fourth largest after the US, 
EU and China. All this leads to a community of opportunities. So how do you get involved and what are the next steps for companies looking to get into this potential market? Next slide, please. So this is where we fit in as the UK ASEAN Business Council. We are the leading UK-based organization promoting trade and investment between the UK and ASEAN's dynamic markets. Created of the, out of the then UK Trade and Investment, now the Department for International Trade, as part of their 2011 strategy, Britain Open for Business, the UK ABC was launched by the then Business Secretary, Right Honourable Vince Cable, in November 2011. We help companies of all sizes build new contacts, provide market insights, and raise awareness of the vast commercial developments in what is undoubtedly one of the most exciting, vibrant and fastest growing regions in the world. We also bring ASEAN to the UK through a sustained calendar of country briefings, targeted meetings with ASEAN decision makers and promotional events. In addition, we signpost practical advice and guidance on how to do business in ASEAN and can provide access to a considerable network of useful contacts. Next slide, please. We work extremely closely with the UK and ASEAN governments, key partner organizations, including the British Chambers of Commerce in ASEAN, influential corporates, experienced SMEs, market experts, and professional service providers. We have created an extensive UK ASEAN business network that links UK innovation and expertise with ASEAN's commercial developments. Next slide, please. These are just some of the logos of the companies and business groups that, and uh, governments that we have partnerships with. And uh, you can see on the top, the large corporates that are also working extensively in the ASEAN region. And all these companies are patrons of the UK Asian Business Council. So we have a wealth of information and advice, uh, knowledge uh, between those two companies that are partners within UK Asian Business Council. Next slide, please. UK ASEAN Business Council is also part of a bigger picture, working with our sister councils, the China British Business Council, the UK India Business Council, and the Department for International Trade, together covering the ASEAN region. And just looking at that circle on the right hand side of the slide, um, where we have Southeast Asia, India, and China and more people are living inside that circle than outside of it. So this must really be one reason alone uh, to want to get involved in ASEAN business opportunities. Next slide, please. So why choose ASEAN? Uh, just to recap a little bit, ASEAN is a growth story of 10 countries, a diverse community, home to over 630 million people, and strategically located in the central nexus of Asia between China and India. Despite challenging economic externalities, regional and global investors remain vested in ASEAN in view of its relatively stable economies. Member countries are anticipated to generate healthy GDP growth rates between 3 and 8% over the next four years. In the longer term, ASEAN's growth will continue to be shaped by economic policies, regional trade policies, investment incentives, and infrastructure financing capacities and capabilities. Next page, please. So just wanted to show you really um, some brief information about the country. These are country snapshots of around six of the ASEAN uh, countries, a little bit of information there about their GDP growth and populations, uh, as well as some information there about uh, the sector opportunities. Uh, so Cambodia is a developing market economy with a very open investment policy 
and real opportunities for creative entrepreneurs and dynamic businesses. It has experienced a 7% annual growth rate for the last five years. Cambodia is a unique country which provides a number of opportunities across different sectors. Indonesia is a country about big numbers and big opportunities. With 240 million inhabitants, it is the world's fourth most populous country and the largest in Southeast Asia. The largest economic sector in Indonesia is the manufacturing and processing, which contributes around 24% of their GDP. Some major industries in this sector include food and beverage, machinery and transportation, chemicals and textiles, farming and fishery, and the hospitality sector. Next slide, please. Malaysia, decades of strong industrial growth and political stability have made Malaysia one of Southeast Asia's most vibrant and successful economies. It offers a low cost business environment, high skill levels, and relatively low salary costs for qualified professionals and executives. Malaysia is a prime tourist destination, offering unique traditional attractions amidst modern day development. Myanmar, well, we've heard a lot of Myanmar in, in, in the uh, press quite recently, um, but it has recently, and we're talking about business, recently re-emerged onto the global stage after 50 years of isolation. It's a country of over 50 million people, in the strategic location between China and India with plentiful natural resources. Economic growth uh, of 8.5% makes Myanmar the fastest growing country in Southeast Asia. It's still developing, it has vast resources and outdated infrastructure, so the opportunities are hard, huge, but there is also a range of obstacles. Next slide, please. Philippines, just to quote um, from one of the largest banks working in ASEAN, HSBC, they forecasted that the Philippines could become the world's 16th largest economy by 2050, making it an attractive and exciting prospect for UK businesses. Today, the Philippines is currently Southeast Asia's fastest growing country and has taken over the growth leadership role among ASEAN member countries. Singapore increasingly serves as a hub for Southeast Asia across an extensive range of financial and business services. The services sector makes up over two thirds of G GDP share dominated by financial and business services. Singapore is the fourth global financial center after London, New York, and Hong Kong, and the second largest wealth management center outside of Switzerland. Um, you can see on that slide, the ease of doing business ranking as number one in the world. In actual fact, they've been knocked off that top spot. They are now number two, been knocked off by New Zealand, but still are number one in the ASEAN region for the ease of doing business. Next slide. Thailand offers exciting business opportunities to companies prepared to take a serious interest in this dynamic market. It's the second largest economy in ASEAN, accounting for 17% of the ASEAN GDP. Thailand's economy is in the top three in ASEAN in terms of size and volume of international trade. Vietnam has one of the largest, sorry, one of the fastest growing, most vibrant economies in all of Asia. Over the past 10 years, economic growth has been second only to China, and GDP has been doubling every 10 years since 1986. Vietnam is forecast to be one of the top fastest growing economies in the next few decades. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to introduce you to the UK ASEAN Business Council digital platform. It is a new platform and I would recommend that um, you go and have a look at this and uh, register on the site uh, to receive uh, lots of uh, interesting information which will help you 
to decide which markets to look at. Next slide, please. We have a section there which has all our events. Uh, this is not just events that we're doing in the UK, but it's all events in all the ASEAN markets. We have there also um, a page there of export opportunities, which you can select by sector or you can select by country. And this will bring up the uh, routinely posted live export opportunities that are available in ASEAN. If any of you are familiar with the Exporting is Great website, where, the, uh, where you have also typed there for export opportunities, if you click on one of our opportunities, it will take you directly to that export opportunities uh, website link for registration of your interest. Uh, we have, uh, as I said before, an extremely close relationship with the Chambers of Commerce in ASEAN and the Chambers of Commerce there are responsible for um, uploading these business opportunities and also um, coming back after you've shown interest in those export opportunities. There's also on our website a wealth of information regarding uh, countries and sectors, uh, a lot of publications there that you can download, a lot of information about doing business in all the countries in ASEAN. Next page, please. So this is us. We are a, a small team based out of Millbank Tower in London. Um, if you have a look at the picture there, we're very, very close to the Houses of Parliament to the right of us. And immediately to the left is the Tate Gallery. And uh, we feel fairly safe because opposite us on the South Banks is MI6. So we're feeling very comfortable there. Uh, the team is headed up by our executive director, Ross Hunter. And we have uh, a couple of colleagues, Alan and Max there, who are responsible for partnerships and programs, our corporate affairs and business development. Myself and Jeff Charlesworth, we are both, um, I would say the foot soldiers out there in that big wide world of the UK, um, advising companies and signposting companies to these exciting markets in ASEAN. Georgina uh, is our events manager. She's taking care of all our events here in the UK and uh, very much involved with the events overseas. And Marcus is responsible for our digital content and marketing uh, and um, obviously was uh, at the forefront of developing our new digital platform. Next slide, please. So that is me. Um, thank you very much for um, for listening to me, and I'll hand you back over to Will. Many thanks, Paul. A really great um, overview of some of the markets and some, some of the opportunities in a, a really fantastic, uh, interesting part of the world. I'm now going to hand over to Godfrey Sapka from the Institute of Exports and International Trade, who will talk about some of his experiences doing business out in out in the region. So over to you, Godfrey. Thanks very much, Will. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone uh, based here in the UK and uh, to our colleagues listening in uh, Asia to you, good evening. So, as Will mentioned, uh, my name is Godfrey Subka and I'm the Education Delivery Manager for the Institute of Exports and International Trade. Um, for today, what I'm going to talk about is my experience previously um, uh, working as regional manager or regional operations manager for various uh, UK and US companies in ASEAN, um, which I did for about 17 years, um, 12 years of which was uh, uh, based living and working in the region, other, the other five years um, flying in from close by. And where this may be useful for some of the um, uh, participants on the uh, on this uh, webinar is that several of the companies were small companies. And when I say that, uh, between 50 and 150 people. Um, so a slightly different experience to, 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 to a larger company which may have a regional presence already in place. And a, a couple of these were uh, startups, regional startups in ASEAN. Another thing is that <clears throat> these were all in the area of financial technology. So it was uh, software and associated services. Now, by contrast to my uh, colleague, who's got the next panelist, uh, Neil, 
yeah, he'll be talking about the the, the experience of um, more of a goods manufacturer um, uh, selling into the region, whereas my experience was much more of a soft goods, uh, software and associated services. So there's a good contrast there um, for different industries represented by the delegates or the participants on the webinar today. So I'm going to talk about um, <clears throat> single, just two countries, Singapore and Indonesia. I have operated in other countries, but those are the two countries that I know best and that I've lived and worked in, and then to give you some uh, top tips at the end. So next slide, please. So um, um, first of all, my apologies to anybody who knows these two countries well. I'm working on the basis that some people listening today won't do so, and so some of this information may be obvious to some of you. Um, it is an excellent regional base. Um, as Paul was saying, if not the, f the first, then certainly the second, I think still probably the first, the best country in the world to set up a business. Um, I've personally set up a company in less than a day. Um, uh, I've been involved in another <coughs> company coming in to set up. Um, we worked with, um, we were just a small company. Um, we worked with a dedicated government department, which helped us as in uh, giving us investor support, help with tax, help with uh, connections, help with visas. Um, they really worked very hard to make sure that if not just large, but small companies set up in, uh, in the state. It's very easy to get visas, not just working visas. There is now the concept, the foreign local. Uh, there are now thousands of people who've come, and many of them from, from Europe or North America or Australia, um, not just from the region, who've come to set up small businesses in Singapore, sometimes just to, um, servicing the local community, in some cases as a regional hub. Um, there is, of course, in Singapore, a rock solid rule of law uh, and legal certainty. Um, and if you're working in a business of intellectual property or work contracts are, are critical, it is definitely a good place to work. Uh, although it's an expensive city, the, the startup costs are minimal. I've also done startups in Dubai, which compares itself to Singapore, and the cost of startup costs were much higher and much less efficient. And there were certain places that we had to start up, certain things we had to do, certain costs we had to pay, whether we wanted to or not. With Singapore, as you can see in the middle picture, this is actually where my office was based in my last company in Singapore, a place called the Working Capital. It's a converted biscuit factory in Chinatown. And each of those people sitting at desks, there may be a team of four people as we were, or it might be an individual person, or it might be a couple of tables, hot desking. And we were running our whole um, um, Asia Pacific operation from that uh, hot desk up, um, facility there. And there are several of those. So it's very easy to start, set up and do business there. There's a great ecosystem in Singapore, whatever you need, whether it's printing, whether it's legal advice, whether it's translation, um, uh, or uh, whether it's software development, whether it's branding, uh, all of the things that you would need are going to be available on hand in Singapore. Uh, and this is not me saying this from the from the promoting Singapore. This is really from my experience of living and working there for many years. There's also a large ASEAN diaspora. So if you want to work in um, export it from there into um, Thailand or into Myanmar or into Vietnam. There are plenty of people living and working there with long-term visas, working visas that you can recruit, recruit to help you with those um, ventures. There is an excellent workforce, very, very high skilled, but unfortunately, well, perhaps unfortunately, there is very, very full employment and high wages, and there is a tendency for people to job hop so it's not difficult to find people. <clears throat> the difficulty is to get them on board and to keep them. There's excellent communication links. Um, um, my apartment in, in Singapore had um, 30 megabit um, broadband in, I think it was around about uh, 2000, 2001. Um, and uh, so they're way ahead of the rest of us in terms of communication links. In terms of air communication, very good. Um, I would also give a shout out here to Kuala Lumpur uh, with Air Asia, which is in, in some ways better for communication links around the region because it's a low cost airline. It, it, so, but, but, from, but in most ways, I would say that Singapore is a much better hub. Um, so as I mentioned, the living costs are, are high, but the standard living is good there as well if, you, if you're looking at uh, living there long term. If you're exporting into Singapore itself, um, rather than using it as a hub. There is a very good market, certainly for high-end goods, not just with the local community, but with um, tourists and visitors coming through. 
So that's Singapore in a nutshell. So if we can just go on to the next slide to talk about Indonesia, um, where I spent a little bit of a shorter time in a um, different uh, industry. Um, now, in some ways, Indonesia is, and I mean this in a nice way, I love Indonesia, but it, it, it is everything that Singapore isn't and vice versa. Um, it's a very strong uh, contrast. It is uh, huge. Um, there are so many different figures of what the population is at the moment. The one I found it was a 260 million, growing at around about 5%, as Paul said. The middle class, if you define the middle class as a, um, a per capita income of $10,000 uh, per annum, is growing by about 11% per annum. Um, so that's the market for uh, washing powder, baby milk, consumer products in general, entry-level consumer products is growing very, very uh, quickly. And ICF Monitor expects that to be about 74 million to 121 million by 2020. So that's a huge market in itself. Um, low costs for everything from um, staff to services, premises, etc. And even for an exporter, this can be very important um, because certainly at our business, there was never a simple case of export and import. There was often a case of um, co-production. So we would be developing software in, in the UK. We would then be adding on parts of it in, in Indonesia, maybe doing translation of the software, providing support, uh, and then uh, using that as a base to um, sell into the region. So the, uh, Indonesia is definitely a good place to do part of your production. Um, I, that also works for um, uh, for hard goods as well. There's a, there's a, a growing industrial, especially light industrial base in, in Indonesia. Often there's very good English, unlike the Philippines where lots of people speak English. It's not so many in Indonesia, but the educated uh, community does speak English very well. Um, transparency um, is a problem. That's, for, that's, that's true for a lot of countries. Uh, in fact, most of them apart from Singapore. Uh, it is it is a problem for for Indonesia, especially if it's if you're a large business. Um, the expectations are there, um, but it is possible to do business. British companies are doing business, and uh, uh, it's not something I think that uh, need be a, a barrier. Um, there is a huge consumer market, as I mentioned, but that definitely needs local partnership. Um, it, uh, there, are, there are large industrial um, Indonesian companies to work with that can help get products out of the consumer market. There is also a huge infrastructure opportunity. I noticed that Paul was saying 46 billion um, per annum. I would say that probably half of that is in Indonesia. I've certainly seen a figure of more than 100 billion as a backlog in terms of infra infrastructure. Uh, that is huge, but it's of course very hard to realize and there is a danger of, of um, whether the investor in infrastructure is actually going to um, be paid on the original terms as time goes on. And then that brings me to my next point. It is very, very obviously, stating the obvious, very important to, to make sure one gets paid. Um, and that's something that needs to be taken into consideration. The legal certainty is not the same as it would be in Singapore. And I've got some hints later on on that. Um, I mentioned it's a very good hinterland for doing uh, business, for expanding out into the region. And, and finally, um, Paul mentioned Britcham. Britcham is one of a number of um, chambers of commerce in, 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 uh, in Jakarta. And I used to go to the cocktail parties of just about all of them. And it's a very tightly knit expat community. And you can, you can bump into ambassadors. You can bump into ministers. You, you make friends with somebody who knows all the people that you need to talk to and you can just turn up to these events. That's something that's not necessarily the case, for example, in Singapore. Um, it's, it's much easier to break into these levels in Indonesia, in my experience. So can we move to the final slide, which is the top tips? So certainly from my experience, um, the business was more uh, an international trade model rather than just exports. So a combination of, of um, import and export, um, produ producing uh, original intellectual property in the UK, onward developing it in one country and then marketing it out into third countries. Certainly in my experience of selling to businesses is so much easier than, than selling to consumers. And my recommendation is that in all of these countries, 
that there's a strong need to, to find partners who are in a position to get your product out into the market. And one thing I would emphasize in terms of looking for partners is not looking for potential, but looking for somebody who's done it before, who sold products like yours to uh, specific customers or specific market that, that show that they can do it. Um, I also would advise making sure that your, your partner, especially outside of Singapore, has some, uh, something to lose, uh, not just to your product, um, but some, um, ideally where you are the, the, the customer as well as supplier. I've had relationships with partners where not only have they marketed our product in, for example, Indonesia, but we've marketed a product of theirs elsewhere in the world. That meant that um, on top of the contract, there was something that was uh, uh, a, a sound business reason for them to um, to look after us. And uh, that's something that I, that I would emphasize, especially in Indonesia and some of the peripheral countries. If you really do need to have hard contracts, I would say try to find com companies with entities in, for example, Singapore or Australia or the UK, where you can contract with them and then do business in the other countries. Um, I would, oh, then that links to the point further down about making sure that you get getting paid. Um, skipping on down, my experience obviously is somebody who's lived and worked there. Not all companies can do that. And not all companies would want to do that. But I would say if you do believe that you have a market in ASEAN, I would really recommend getting as much uh, immersed as possible. If you have a base, it does show commitment, and I think people's attitude changes. That might not be a first step, but I would recommend it as an early second step. And once you've got your base, I would say don't stay there. So if you're based in Singapore, you then need again to get out there and on, on a plane, out into, the, into Myanmar, Cambodia, Philippines, Vietnam, wherever you want to sell. I really recommend understanding the local con the culture, not just at uh, the initial, um, very valuable culture shock. Um, culture shocks is a great uh, uh, series of books, but I would say go beyond that. Uh, I've seen people, expatriates, who've really um, learned a lot of what's going on, reading the English language newspapers. There's some very good English language newspapers. Um, it's good to learn some local language. It's good to make friends there. Um, that can really help you a great deal. And I would say take some small risks. Um, don't, you know, about the farm on those risks, but that's the best way to, to learn is to take some of the, some of some small risks. They may go wrong, but you'll learn and gain experience and compared to your competitors, you'll get a much better understanding of how those um, uh, markets work. And related to that, most of my successes have come from trust and a few of my failures have come from trust. Uh, it, it's a double-edged sword but it's something that uh, is essential. And if you can learn how to, to take a risk and trust uh, in these markets, then I think you'll gain a great deal. Uh, and trust is often returned as well. Um, and I would suggest if you are interested in this market, to, um, once you have done your initial research, once you've, taken, once you've taken the first steps, try to show some commitment to the market and make a decision that you're going to be successful. You're not exactly sure how or when, but, you, but you're going to make sure that you are. And then by, by trial and error, you'll get to where you want to be. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. So finally, just a little bit about the, uh, the Institute of Export and International Trade. As I mentioned, I head up the uh, education delivery here. Um, so the Institute was established back in 1935 and it is the professional membership body uh, representing and supporting the interests of everyone involved in importing, uh, exporting and international trade. And we recently changed our name from the Institute of Export to the Institute of Export and International Trade to, rep to represent the increasing complexity of international trade, the global supply tra chain, where, where very often what you're exporting is something that's been imported. And this goes on many, many times. Um, we have specialist expertise around how international trade works, from custom to shipping, to the financial services and overseas payments, and very much people are asking us about um, uh, our opinions and our, and our expertise in, in relation to Brexit. That's very much the, the issue of the day, of course. Um, 
we um, want to be at the forefront of key developments and we take a lot of effort to make sure that we are in international trade, uh, spearheading the professionalization of the uh, industry and having uh, keynote speakers in major events. And the area that I, well, well, training and qualifications, I don't get involved in the training, but I get involved in the qualifications. Um, both of those are designed to boost the careers of individuals working in, individual, in international trade and their skills and knowledge um, so that they can um, enhance those careers in international trade. Um, in terms of the qualifications that we do, they are from level two, which is around about the GCSE level in the UK, right up to level seven, which is master's degree level which we um, provide either independently or in conjunction with um, other academic in institutions, including universities. Um, and they tend to be either at the module level of uh, something around about a, um, a term, uh, four months up to around about uh, uh, three years, um, if you're interested in the qualifications. So thanks very much. I'd like to hand back to Will. Many thanks, Godfrey. Uh, really great to, to hear some, some real kind of comprehensive experiences, certainly in, in those two, two markets. Before I hand over to Neil, I just want to quickly remind everyone that you can ask questions at any point in, over the next 20 or so minutes. It's a great opportunity to talk to people who have really been in the markets and understand the region um, and to really try and get some answers to, to questions I know that you have. But now to talk about uh, his experiences as an exporter to the region and also um, in particular to Vietnam, Thailand and Myanmar, over to you, Neil. Hello and thank you and uh, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Just first of all, I wanted to, to give you a little bit of background into who we are, um, just to give you an idea of what we're trying to achieve out there in the ASEAN area. Um, we're a manufacturer of sealants and coatings, but we specialize in passive fire protection products. And this is where we find much of our success with export. These products are used in, in the construction of buildings and they stop fire spreading throughout buildings. And we export this in the protector brand, which is our own brand. And we will also um, do white label, private label for other people. Over the last four years, we've had a, an increased focus on export. So if you looked at our figures in 2012, export was 20% of our total business. Um, and if you look at us in 2017, 80% of our total business is export. So we've completely turned the business model around. And in that period, we've actually doubled the size of the business as well. You've already moved on to the next slide for me, thank you. Um, I've been looking after export sales here at Polyseam for the last four years, um, been around many places around the world, but I'm just going to concentrate on three areas. Um, and it's the ASEAN experience, as it was. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Vietnam, Thailand and Myanmar. And if you also just look there on that exporting slide, we won Export Business of the Year um, in 2016 at the Sheffield Business Awards. So it's uh, just a nice little little token of our success that we've had in exporting. So if you could move on to the next slide, please. Right, Vietnam. It was the first project I undertook in the region. Um, and I've started to use a certain formula where I go to a local provider um, on the ground in the country I want to deal with. Um, you can go through the SEM Business Council and if you do that, you'll probably end up with a British business group in Vietnam who will undertake a project for you. And if you give them the correct information and tell them what you want, they'll research the local market and come back with a, a long list of suitable partners for you. And then after a few discussions moving around, um, you come up with a short list and you identify the people you actually want to get out and see. Now, what happened over in Vietnam, we set up eight meetings. Um, it took around about a week. Uh, some of the meetings in Hanoi, some in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, so we did, as I say, we did all the meetings in a week. Then it was back home to follow up. Luckily, we identified a very keen partner over there uh, and I managed to get back to him to see him again within six months. 
you find in this area that relationship is very, very important. They want to spend time with you. They want to get to know you. Um, there's some little tips on the right hand side that I've put there. Vietnam is an emerging market and it's quite informal and relaxed. Most of the people so were quite young, very, very keen to succeed. What I didn't do was allow enough time to socialize. They want to get to know you, like I said, they want to take you for a coffee or, or a tea. Um, they want to go out for a meal with you and really get to know you. The reason I actually went back so quickly to Vietnam is I didn't leave time to have visitor with this guy. He was now a very good customer over there. So I basically flew back over to have dinner with him. So um, again, building on that relationship. So uh, the other thing I put there is keep an open mind because you're going to get taken out to lunch. and It's not quite what you expect. It's a little bit different. So keep an open mind and just just get involved and, uh, you know, eat what they eat. It, it's It's quite good for you. The last thing I will say is payment terms. I'm dealing with Vietnam pro forma basis. We quote pro forma, they pay, we send the goods. They do expect this, so it's not a surprise to them. So uh, don't be scared to ask for the money up front. It, it will work. If we could move on to the next slide, please. Thailand, after the success in Vietnam, did exactly the same thing, went over there, did a research project with uh, a local provider. What I found in Thailand, very, very different to Vietnam. I got there, it's quite a developed market, especially for the products that, that we operate with. And there were lots of competition over there. So all the big players were already there, already have their um, designated supply routes. And American standards seem to have taken over in Thailand and we sell with a lot of European standard and British standard products. So it's not quite as easy to operate in Thailand as I had hoped it would be. So at the moment, we're, um, we've been over there, we've met people. I have one guy who's very keen, but haven't identified the right partner yet. But with this area, it's persistence. So I've now started project number two, and we'll be visiting again in um, in January next year and we'll be going through the whole process again and hopefully this time we find the right partner to help sell our, our products in Thailand. The tips, very very different to, to Vietnam. I've got over there, it is quite formal. I did go everywhere in a suit and a shirt and the exchanging of business cards in, in the sort of Asian manner with the thumbs on top of the card, two-handed across, quite formal. So you know, make sure you get into the habit of doing that. They do expect it. One thing that caught me out completely that nobody had warned me about was removing my shoes at the door. Even when you turn up at a factory, it shoes off. And uh, sometimes they provide you with a little pair of slippers to go in with. Um, it, it caught me by surprise, but you get used to it very, very quickly. I put there, eat the local food. It's fantastic. Just, just get stuck in and eat it. And the other real top tip is allow plenty of time if you're driving or going by taxi. The traffic is horrendous everywhere. So everywhere takes two or three times as long as you think it will to get to. And you will spend a lot of time traveling. And next slide, please. Myanmar. Right, exactly the same process as before. Project, long list, short list, appointments, fly over to meet people. And on arriving in Yangon, completely different. Um, what an unbelievable place. Very, very obvious that it's a developing market. As I say, it's different. I got in the car. The car was right-hand drive. We set off down the road. You drive on the right. The next car I get in is a left-hand drive. Luckily, you still drive on the right. It, it's a bizarre place, and it takes a little bit of getting used to. I knew before I went that currently they don't even use the products that we supply. So I went over there to try and educate people, get them to know the products, show them where they should be using them. I actually managed to present to the Myanmar Fire Department um, and some government officials came along. They are starting to realize they need to protect their high rise buildings against the spread of fire. And we are, or we were actually the first people to take passive fire protection products to show in Myanmar. 
So um, it's going to be a slow process. It's going to take some time, but it is good to be the first people on the ground. There's a lot of red tape. There's a lot of government influence and control. So things will take time and you're going to have to have a lot of patience. Now, Myanmar is quite new and it's come out of sanctions. Um, I was advised that the sanctions had cleared before I got there, but there are some difficulties still with some banks and some credit cards. They didn't like anything I had, couldn't use anything. So take cash, US dollars, you can change it to local currency there. That's what got me through the week there. Again, remove shoes for meetings, got used to it in Thailand. The same thing applies there. And the other top tip is the same as last time, eat the food. The food is fantastic. So if you could have the next slide, please. This is just to, to recap, really, and to just try and give you the enthusiasm I've got for it, to just go out there and find some contacts. Use the resources available. Speak to the people through this, through this network here. They'll put you in touch with the people on the ground who can find the contacts for you. Then you've just got to get on a plane, meet some people, promote the fact that your products are British made, if they are. They'd absolutely love British made products. And then just watch your business grow. And it's profitable business you'll get from these export areas as well. So thank you very much. I'd like to hand you back to Will. Many thanks, Neil. Really interesting to, to hear about um, your company's experiences and certainly to hear about, um, some, again, some very interesting mar markets. First question I'm actually going to put to Neil, we've had it through the our admin inbox rather than through the Citrix panel. Um, just a reminder that you can ask questions using the panel to the right hand side. Um, there's a question tab there and you can just send them in there. Um, but the question we've had in is, are translators essential when presenting or sending goods into Myanmar, or is English acceptable slash understood? Uh, so Neil, what's your experience uh, in terms of language in Myanmar? Um, yeah, the, the people I met over there, the English was was very good in Myanmar, and I didn't actually need a translator anywhere. Um, so yeah, it was, it was very, very good and very, very easy. And certainly my communication since has been in English via email and English on the telephone. And for me on this occasion, it's worked well in English. And uh, I mean, I'll, I'll put that a bit to Paul more more broadly. Is is translation something you recommend for some of the, the markets out there, or is it, is it um, generally English is, is good enough in, in a lot of countries there? It does vary from country to country, uh, and in some countries, it is advisable to to have a, a translator. And um, I would recommend that. Um, you don't just pick up anybody off the street to do that, that you would go through a recognized body. And that's, uh, I think, as, as Neil mentioned, um, this is one of the services available from the British Chambers of Commerce that are out in there as yeah, and they can fix you up with a, a qualified interpreter um, that is totally unbiased and uh, will, will certainly be telling you exactly what, um, what uh, the people who you're speaking to are saying. So it varies from country to country. I think Neil, in his situation, has been quite fortunate, particularly in those countries where um, English is, is widely spoken. Singapore, of course, is English. Uh, the Philippines is, is English. But when you move it over to countries such as uh, Brunei um, and Cambodia, um, it may mean that you need some kind of uh, translator. Many thanks. Many thanks, Paul. Um, we just had a question in from John. It would be a good one for Godfrey, actually. Um, he's had a LinkedIn connection in Malaysia uh, who has shown interest in a technology, in bad technology as an agent. Is there a service by which you can validate people who are interested in, in kind of service software kind of uh, offerings? Um, so, John, you're saying that you've got a potential agent in, in Malaysia who's interested in being a partner. And what you were saying, the question was, how do you validate them, et cetera? Um, so um, I think it, I might actually pass part of this to Paul in terms of how the local chamber of commerce might be able to check them out. 
um, what, or, um, or the uh, local uh, uh, equivalent of uh, UK ABC might be able to check them out. Otherwise, to be honest with you, I think it's difficult. Um, what, okay, when I've done this in the past, I have really gone uh, into the country, and, and uh, mainly because I was already based there, and met with people and looked at their business and got them to explain. But the key thing for me is what they're doing at the moment. Um, because I, I think it's important for the partner to be an existing channel to market rather than taking a risk on someone who's never done this before. So really to talk to them about their, to their customers and maybe talk to their customers about them and uh, uh, find more about their history. But in, that's obviously going to be quite difficult. But in general terms, it may be that the local Chamber of Commerce may be able to express an opinion on them. Paul, is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, we probably haven't spoken too much about the British Chambers of Commerce out there in ASEAN and what they actually do, but they are uh, very, very similar to the Chambers of Commerce that we have here in the UK. Um, they all are accredited by the British Chambers of Commerce here, and um, when they reach a certain grade, they are and able to deliver the same services to the same quality that our British Chambers of Commerce here in the UK. Um, for companies looking to get into the ASEAN markets, the British Chambers of Commerce um, uh, provide uh, market entry services for companies who want to sell their products and services into those countries. Um, as, as Neil has mentioned, um, they provide a service to find partners, distributors and agents for you. And part and parcel of that process is a due, due diligence. So they will be looking at companies in the marketplace, talking to the companies and, and giving them a brief about your products and services and whether there is um, um, an interest to do business with you. And that's one of the um, uh, part and parcel of, of, of looking and finding a particular partner. But it is about due diligence. Um, the British Chambers of Commerce will not put a company in front of you who's, well, dare I say, a, you know, a Mickey Mouse com company. They will be putting you in a company that's that's um, trading. Um, it is reporting. It is um, it is well known in the marketplace. Has a good history of, of trading. So they will do that due diligence for you on your behalf to ensure that you are dealing with a legitimate company. Um, I'd like to add a point to something I've just remembered. This is Godfrey here again. Um, there was a time when I was looking for new uh, partners in new markets, and this was again with financial software. And uh, what we did was to look for people who were already partners of other international software companies. So we looked for people who were, we looked on the list of people who were selling Microsoft Dynamics and other ERP systems because some of these were publicly available. And we, that then meant that at least they had been approved by somebody else. Uh, so at least Microsoft or uh, SAP or whoever um, had trusted these people. And that was at least some indication that they had done some, hopefully they had done some due diligence with them and uh, used those as an additional, as an initial long list to start to start the process with. Many thanks, Godfrey. We're actually getting uh, a fair few good questions coming through now. So. Um, this is one from Rachel, and also Stephen's asked something similar. It's Rachel asks, and I might put this to Neil first, are you using the paid for research introduction and meeting arrangement services or finding contacts and arranging meetings yourselves? Stephen asks, does DIT sort of own this? Uh, I might ask Paul in a second, but first to Neil, how did you meet your kind of partners out there? Was it kind of a matter of paid for services or was it trade shows? Kind of, how did you go about that? Yeah, we use the paid for services. Um, I've got a very detailed brief that I give the Chambers of Commerce, so it hopefully tells them exactly what I'm looking for. Um, and for a reasonable fee, I don't want to say what we pay exactly, but it's not it's not out of the ordinary. Um, they will do a full research project for you. And like I say, they come back with a long list of companies. You discuss with them, have a look through, see which you think are going to be the ones that will, you know, really be partners for you then you work it down to a shortlist 
and then they will actually arrange the meetings for you as well. So um, all you have to do is basically get on a plane and go out there and, and meet people. If there are some cultural issues or language issues, the, the chambers won't just leave you on, on your own. They'll send a representative to visit with you or they'll arrange for translators to come and sit with you when, when English is not you know, the, the, the first language or they don't feel the people are confident in English that you're going to meet. Um, we've tried the trade show route. It works, but trade shows, it's a, it's a very expensive way of doing it and you don't know who you're going to find. We find these targeted paid research projects work very, very well through the, uh, through the Chambers of Commerce. Thanks, thanks, um, thanks, Neil. And Paul, I mean, Stephen asked about um, do, do, if do, do IT sort of the OMIS reports. So do, do you know if they still do? Sorry, I started to speak in there, and I, I hadn't unmuted myself. Um, yeah, through Department of International Trade, um, there are now around thirty-four countries which um, which um, where where the OMIS service is now done by private sector delivery partners and in the main that is with the British Chambers of Commerce. Uh, this is the case in, so, so if, if people have done um, the OMIS uh, program through Department of International Trade, um, through the Chambers of Commerce now it's called a business support service um, but it's, it's more or less the same which is a, a paid service for for companies who are looking in to get into that market and looking for, for, for partners and things like this. Um, that is the trend and the way that the Department for International Trade are going um, because they want to free up the resources in those countries uh, to do what government do, does best um, at the SCOs there, which is government, government, government to government um, engagement and influencing. And then the, the trade services are done by uh, by third-party uh, delivery partners. And it's the same in ASEAN. So all of ASEAN countries, um, with the exception of, of Laos at the moment, um, those, those services, market entry services, are delivered by the British Chambers of Commerce. In actually, in, um, in Vietnam, it's the British Business Group Vietnam, uh, but basically is a Chamber of Commerce and is accredited in the same way as a Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Paul. We're going to do one last question. Um, and to, to those who we haven't been able to get to their questions yet, we'll, we'll try and follow up with you afterwards. Um, this question is from Oliver, and he's actually asked, kind of follows on from it, and he's asked, um, do bodies like UKBC help with drafting um, partnership distributor kind of contracts in the markets? And more personally, um, should issues arrive do these contracts actually hold any value? Um, I'll put that first through to Paul and then um, open the floor to, to Godfrey or Neil if they have got any further comment. So, Paul. Um, as UK ABC, um, we, we, we do not provide any service when it comes to um, putting, to putting together um, a distributor um, agreement of any sort but um, we do have within our partner organization organizations that certainly are able to uh, help and through our network of, of law firms um, certainly we have uh, plenty of um, opportunities there to help companies to put together a, um, a tailored um, distributor agreement that they can use. Thanks, uh, Paul. This is Godfrey here. Um, I'd just like to talk about the second part, which is, is the contract any use? And I'm sorry if this is a bit of a politician's answer, but the answer is yes and no. And I'll explain what I mean by yes and no. Um, it's really important to have something that shows in, in, in detail and very, very clearly what it is that you have and have not agreed because that is the point where you can pull the contract out and say, we agreed that you would pay this, or we would pay that, or you would do this, or we would do that. And it's got your signatures at the bottom of it. And in most cases, that's all that anybody needs to do is to settle the arguments and to say, 
this is what has been agreed. And so it's absolutely vital to have a good contract. But when I say that, I don't mean in order to protect yourself legally. Because as I was saying earlier, the whether or not you're going to be able to protect yourself legally is going to be dependent upon um, where you're doing business. And it doesn't depend upon where the jurisdiction of the contract is. It depends on who's got the money and who it is you're trying to take legal action against or they're trying to take legal action against you. Um, uh, again, if you if if you are going to be taking legal action in uh, in Singapore, I would be very confident that uh, it would be very fair. In other countries, um, less so. And there's a, there's quite a lot of shades of grey there. And for most of ASEAN, I would suggest that you don't want to be in a situation where you have to in, enforce your contract through law. It, the the legal system can be very different. Uh, Singapore's is based upon the uh, British uh, common law, um, but there are the other completely different legal systems. That's number one, different laws. In Indonesia has many, many laws, many of which actually contradict each other. And it's a history of um, uh, fair enforcement is, is not as good as it should be, if I can say that. Um, so, but, but it's definitely important to have a clear understanding uh, between you very very clear in the contract of what uh, you have agreed to but i would only say it was going to be enforceable if it was in singapore and i hope i haven't been too controversial saying that but that's my that's my view if if i can just add uh, and uh, i agree with we got free totally there and and if i can uh, sort of uh, give you sort of my thoughts of 35 years um, of international business, 25 years of those uh, living and working out in the Middle East and putting together many, many distribution and agency agreements for companies in the Middle East and the Far East and into um, Australasia. Um, the agreement, if you need to have an agreement, is there to protect you. And in most cases is very, very heavily weighted uh, towards uh, the company, the exporting company. And uh, it is there, as, as Godfrey said, it's because you will have within that agreement, whether it's uh, one year, three years or five years, um, a set of targets that your client needs to hit. Um, and once that's agreed, generally that document goes into the bottom of the cupboard and will only probably come out when you have a disagreement. and. Um, be prepared for that to happen um, because your distributor may not perform as you originally agreed. Um, and that's then when your agreement comes uh, into its own uh, legally uh, in, in clearing up any disputes. Um, country of jurisdiction, um, they'll probably all want their own local countries as country's jurisdiction. Um, I would highly recommend if you can and get it agreed to have it under UK law and the jurisdiction in the UK, if you can, because it will be very, very expensive to fight a case out of the UK into uh, Singapore or to Malaysia um, or Indonesia. Uh, so that's just my experience of, of contracts and agreements, if that's helpful. Many thanks, Paul, and um, many thanks also to Godfrey and Neil for uh, the answer to the questions there, uh, and for the presentations as well. Uh, so really, um, we've actually started over one, which I think in this case is a good thing, because I think it's been a very good session. So thank you very much, um, all three of you. And uh, I also recommend over one, read the guide um, on our selecting a market page, which the UK, AEBC have kindly contributed recently, which gives further tips for selling into the region. You are warmly invited to the Institute of Export and International Trade's annual members dinner in November. Open to all, it's a great chance to find out more about the Institute, celebrate the UK's achievements in international trade, and also hear Michael Portillo give what I'm sure will be an intriguing speech. And if you're looking to further your career or gain the skills needed to advance your company's exporting prospects, the Institute does offer a wide range of qualifications, as Godfrey alluded to earlier, and these really do help individuals and business to thrive in international trade. Our next webinar is on Wednesday next week, and it's one we're running with Currency UK about staying on top of fluctuating currency rates 
a topic that many of you will likely have had at the front of your mind over the last 15 months or so since obviously the pound has plunged following the referendum. As always, please do take our exit survey to let us know what you thought of today's webinar and to give any suggestions for improvements or future topics. That's all from us for now. Have a great week and goodbye.